Uh, my talk is called Fast, Curious, and Insecure. And the goal of this research topic was to find out how secure modern day passive keyless entry and start systems really are. Now, a passive keyless entry and start system is used in modern day vehicles. So you keep the key fob in your pocket at all times. When you approach the vehicle, it automatically unlocks and it automatically starts. So you no longer have to press a button. The way this usually works is the car will send a challenge to the key fob. The key fob computes a cryptographic response and sends it back to the car. If the response is correct, the car will unlock. We take one of these key fobs and we open it up. This is what the backside of the PCB looks like. There's not much interesting going on. There's a UHF antenna, an L antenna, and a transmitter chip. The front side is more interesting because we can see that this is one big chip. And in this case, that's a Texas Instruments TMS 37F 128. Now, if you take an X ray image of this chip, you will see that there's actually two chips inside of it, or two dies. One of them is an MSP430 general purpose microcontroller that runs all of the application level code. And then there's a transponder. And the transponder stores all of the cryptographic keys and does all of the cryptographic operations. The microcontroller can interact with the transponder using an SPI interface. Now, um, when I wanted to get started with this project, I had to get some of these chips to figure out what they can do. But as it turns out, you can't just go online and buy them because you have to sign NDAs. Now, luckily, COSIC is a very international research group, and uh, some of my Chinese colleagues are from Oil and from Taobao. And once we got the chips, it turns out that they're a very uncommon package type, so we designed our own small breakout part to be able to connect to the chip more easily. So the chips we ordered are actually the transponder itself without the included microcontroller. Now, what you would usually do next is get a data sheet and start reading. But in this case, to get data sheets, you have to get signed NDAs, which is something we don't want to do. There is some public information available on the chips, but it's very inconsistent. So you can easily find two distinct routes for the same chip, which makes it very annoying to connect to the chip and try to interact with it. So the initial goal was to connect an Arduino to this chip, so we could send SPI commands to it. When you connect all of this on a breadboard, it looks something like this. And then to start sending SPI um, commands, you need to understand that SPI usually has three interface lines. So there's a clock line, there's a data line for data going from the master to the slave. In this case, the master is the Arduino and the slave is the transponder. And then there's a second data line going the other way. Now the Texas Instruments decided to add a fourth line in this case, which is called the busy line. And that's used by the transponder, so the slave, to indicate when it's, next, when it's ready to receive the next byte of data. You can also see the general SPI frame structure. So the first byte is a length byte, and it indicates how many bytes will follow this byte. Then there's a command, and then there can be one or more data bytes. The transponder can again reply with some of its own data. Now, as it turns out, because we don't have a data sheet, we have to find which available commands there are, and what the correct number of bytes is to send to and it turns out we can use the SPI busy line for this because the busy line will also be used to throw an error. So if you provide um, an incorrect command, the chip will pull the, S the busy line high or low for an extended period of time. It will also throw an error when the length field is incorrect. So we figured out that if we set the length byte to FF and then iterate over all of the commands, we could automatically recover all of the available commands and the number of bytes to provide to each of these commands. So doing this in an automated fashion, we uncovered the following to us interesting commands. So there's two commands that allow you to set a 40-bit key. There's two commands that perform DST40, which is an old 40-bit cipher, but which I'll give more information later on. And then there's an unknown cipher, which also works on 40-bit keys. Now initially you were expecting to find an 80-bit cipher, so we assumed that maybe they combined two 40-bit ciphers into one 80-bit cipher. So at that point, I reverse engineered the unknown cipher um, in a black box way, so by providing input and observing the output. Now later on, it turned out that they are not actually using the cipher, so that was a waste of time. <laughs> then we got our hands on an actual model S people, and we connected a JTAG debugger to it. Uh, apparently, they didn't bother JTAG views, which means that we can read out the program memory of the MSP430. Now we can take this um, binary dump and disassemble all of this code, so we get assembly instructions. 
And then the first step what we do is called static firmware analysis. So we try to identify interesting regions in the code. For the MSQ430, there's two places you can start. You can start with the interrupt vector table, which is stored at the end of flash, and it basically indicates where the program counter will jump when an interrupt occurs. So in the case of the key fob, for example, which code is run when you press a button. Secondly, our um, special function registers. So we are mainly interested in which commands are sent over SPI now. So it's useful to look at where the special function registers associated with SPI are being used. And more particularly, the um, SPI transfer and receive buffers are very interesting. Now, once we've identified um, pieces of code that are interesting, we can go to dynamic analysis, where we use the JTAG debugger to set breakpoints at certain addresses. We then try to unlock the card with the key fob with the debugger attached. When a breakpoint hits, we can dump the memory and see what changed. And this way, we can see which SPI commands are being used. Now, we figured out that the only command that was being used was command 86, which we already knew was a command for DST40. So what is DST40? DST40 is a cipher introduced by Texas Instruments back in 2000. It uses a 40-bit key and it was first reverse engineered back in 2005. Back then, the cipher was mainly used in immobilization systems for cars and in an Exxon Mobile speed pass payment system. This is what a cipher looks like. So at the bottom, we have a 40-bit challenge register and an LFSR configuration. At the top, there's a 40-bit um, challenge register. And then the round function is executed 200 times. Every round produces two bits of output and these two bits get called back into the challenge register. After executing 200 rounds, the 24 least significant bits of the challenge register are returned as a response. So it's important to remember here that there's five bytes of input to the cipher and then 24 bits coming back, or three bytes. So because the cipher is using 40-bit keys, we all know it's insecure by default. Um, but we still don't know how the key fob and car are communicating with each other. And for that, we have to look at ERF signals. And when you take one of these modern day key fobs, you can usually distinguish two systems. There's a remote keyless entry system, in which you press a button on the key fob, and the key fob sends a signal to the car. Secondly, there's the passive keyless entry system, which we're mainly interested in. We also reversed um, the remote keyless entry protocol and how that works, but as I don't have enough time to explain it here, you can read the details in the paper. So, for passive kills entry and start, there is two-way communication. Um, the key fob always sends UHF signals to the car. These signals are rather easy to receive and decode because they have nice tools available. So you can use software-defined radios or a stick one to decode these signals. The low-frequency side is from the vehicle to the key fob, and these signals are rather annoying to receive. Um, in the end, I chose to use a Proxmark 3 because it supports the operating frequency. But does that mean that we have to implement um, a home code on the FPGA of the Proxmark, a home code on the microcontroller of the Proxmark, and I have to modify the circuit to boost uh, the receiver range. So this is what the LF signals look like. So at the top is a signal received by the antenna, then it goes to an amplification stage, then there's an analog peak detect circuit. This uh, signal is then digitized and um, decoded by the FPGA. So this means that I have to spend a few of my weekends like this around the vehicle, and uh, basically what I did here is I taped the antenna of the Proxmark very close to the transmitting antenna of the vehicle because that makes it easier to receive the signals, of course. Now, once you can receive low-frequency and high-frequency signals, you can build a protocol analyzer. So I basically built a Python tool that interacts with the Yardstick 1 and the Proxmark 3, and that allows me to see all the communications that happen between the key and the vehicle. Now what you do is you unlock the vehicle a few times with the real key fob, and you look at what changes in the communication. And by doing this a few times, you can figure out what the protocol looks like. So we figured out that the car sends a wait message at twice a second. So it's basically pulling and seeing if the key fob is nearby. If the key fob is nearby, it will send a reply. And this reply is basically an obfuscated version of the car identifier and the command. Now the obfuscation is very basic, and if you receive these signals from two different cars, it will be very easy to work it out. It's basically a combination of byte swaps and bit shifts. Then when the car thinks the key pop is uh, in proximity, it will send a 40-bit challenge. 
the key fob computes the response and sends it back to the car. Now, as you can see here uh, on slides, uh, you need the car identifier in order for the key fob to send you a response to get a charge. Now, another thing we thought about was could we try to steal a car without ever seeing communication between the key fob and the car, or without ever seeing the key fob itself? And the idea here is that the response is quite short, so we could start randomly guessing one. As it turns out, with about 2 to the 23 guesses, you would get lucky and you would unlock the car. This would take about 97 days, and then you would need an additional 9 hours to be able to start the car. The nice thing about this attack is that it can be automated, because the protocol changes slightly after you unlock the vehicle. Now, this is, of course, not a very practical attack, and we want to show that Reporting with ciphers are not secure in practice, so we built a practical attack. And for this, um, you have to remember that our goal is to recover the 40 bit key as fast as possible. And there's a 40 bit challenge which produces a 24 bit response. So the response is shorter than the input, which means that you will need at least two challenge response bags to recover the full key. Um, and because the keypop has no way of verifying that whoever is sending the challenge is the real vehicle, we can build a time memory trade off table. And the basic idea here is that we pick one challenge, which we fix, and for each possible value of the key, we compute the response, and we group all of the keys that produce the same response to this fixed challenge. So in the end, we have a 5.4 terabyte lookup table with 2 to the 24 files, one file for each response, and each of these files contains about 2 to the 16 keys. So then when we want to clone the EFOP, we first have to obtain um, the car identifier, which you can either sniff from the vehicle by walking past it, and or because it's only two bytes, you could try brute forcing it. Then we send a chosen challenge to the EFOP and record the response. Using this response, we know which, table, which file to fetch from our table, and at that point, the key space is only 2 to the 16. So we send another random challenge to the EFOP, we observe the response, and you use this pair to brute force the remaining 2 to the 16 keys. This takes about 2 seconds on a Raspberry Pi. So we built this device to show the attack in practice. On top there's a, on top, there's a USB power bank which powers all of the hardware. Then there's a Raspberry Pi 3, which is the brains. And then there are two radio interfaces. So the way I use this in practice is I make a hotspot on my phone. The Raspberry Pi connects to the hotspot. I SSH into the Raspberry Pi and I can then control everything that's going on. And then we can also use this internet connection to fetch files from a Bluetooth table. Now, after discovering um, these vulnerabilities, we of course contacted the manufacturers. So we started by contacting Tesla, but then quickly figured out that they didn't build the system themselves. So they bought the system from a company based in the UK called Spectrum. And we later figured out that they built similar systems using the same Texas Instruments chips from McLaren, Karma, and Triumph. So after notifying Tesla, they started working on a new keypop. And this was introduced in June 2018. And they also released some over-the-air software updates that made the attack harder to execute in practice. For people that have um, older models of the vehicle and that didn't upgrade to the new keypop can enable these features, but they're not enabled by default. So one feature is a Basically, a second factor of authentication where you have to enter a pin code on the screen every time you try and start it. And the second one is to disable passive entry on the car side. But this does mean that the key fob will still be listening for signals. But this attack is not, uh, this countermeasure is nice because it prevents the very common relay attack. So, from this research, you can draw some conclusions. And it's pretty sad that we have to show this slide in 2019. Because apparently there's still manufacturers and chip vendors that rely on proprietary cryptography. There's still chip vendors that rely on NDAs for the security of their chips. And there's still car manufacturers and other device manufacturers that rely, rely on tier 1 or tier 2 suppliers to get the security of their high value products right. And some people also still rely on the secrecy of firmware. And there's almost always a way to get firmware out of the device. But then maybe most importantly, um, so Tesla was blamed a lot for using 40-bit keys in their cars, but so did McLaren, Karma, and Triumph, and at least Tesla had a way for us to contact them, and they fixed the issues. 
Whereas for McLaren and Triumph, the story is quite different. I have some funny stories about them, but again, presentation time is too short, so, so you can talk about them over the video later. So we made a video to show how the attack works in practice. I'll talk to it. So if you want to steal a Tesla Model S, it's pretty easy because all of them have to charge at some point, and they all do it in fixed locations. So they all do the Tesla supercharging stations. So all you have to do is go to one of them and wait for someone to park their car. Once they've plugged in their car, they will usually go for a walk because they have to wait 45 minutes, or maybe they go to a nearby coffee shop. So you wait for them to leave, and then as an attacker you have to remember, we need the car identifier. The easiest way to get it is to just walk up to the car and sniff it. So that's what you do first. The thermal output shown on top of the screen is uh, recorded from my phone, basically. And once you have the car identified, you go to your target, you send the fixed challenge and you got the response, you send the second challenge, you got the response, you fetch the correct file from the lookup table, you brute force the remaining uh, 2 to the 16 keys, <coughs> and by the time you back at the vehicle, you have a perfect copy of the key fob. And what you can do is unlock the key fob, uh, unlock the car, don't forget to unplug it. <laughs> And because you have a perfect copy, and because the same key is used to unlock the vehicle and start the vehicle, you can now also start the vehicle and drive off. 